Um, I'm Sarah Moore-Peach, I'm from BBC Radio 3, and I'm really so pleased that the ISM asked me to be part of this panel with such amazing people. Um, I'll just very briefly introduce everyone, um, and then Helen is going to start off with some thoughts, and then we'll all pitch in, and then you'll pitch in, and um, that should take us to the next event. Um, so I'm going to start first of all with John, who's a clarinetist, um, John Slack of the Barclay Ensemble, and then next to him is Sam Ward, pianist um, of Piano Week, Gabby Swallow, who you'll know because you've just heard her play so wonderfully with her urban family, um, then composer Toby Young. Next to Toby is Helena Gaunt from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. She's vice principal and also head of academic affairs, academic research, and has been involved in a really fascinating um, project called Creative Entrepreneurs. And then um, Ruby Hughes, who wasn't actually going to be on this panel, but has um, fantastically come, so we invited her to be part of it as well, who's a mezzo and um, one of the Radio 3 New Generation artists. So, Helena, do you want to kick off with some thoughts which are kind of about how you make it work? Having had, I think, some slightly depressing um, news um, earlier on today about how poorly musicians are paid and how hard it is to forge a career, um, Helen has got some thoughts on how you actually do it. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm just going to share a few thoughts uh, coming out of some research that we did last year around our Creative Entrepreneurs Scheme, which is a scheme where we're trying to support some of our alumni and staff in developing new sustainable businesses. And that's everything from, for example, a company, No Quills, working on dynamic Shakespeare practical workshops in schools, to a company called Bach, for Bach to Baby, which is a wonderful series of concerts for babies, toddlers, and their parents to go along to. Uh, and so we've, do, we've done some research around this, and the first thing to say is what I discovered is musicians aren't terribly entrepreneurial. Don't go away, there's some better news in a minute. Uh, so what we found from the survey was that actually only 29% of us self-reported ourselves as being, having entrepreneurial attributes at a high level. And interestingly, of those, 78% were over 30. So it wasn't all the really young people, necessarily. You may not be surprised that the men were more likely to be entrepreneurial. I'm not very happy about that. And all of us were more inclined towards creating social value than necessarily commercial value. But the good news was that we do have some really strong entrepreneurial attributes. So what we found was that, in general, musicians are very, very good at looking for better and new ways of doing things. You won't be surprised to hear that we're creative and innovative. We're also highly focused on our goals. We can be really persistent in pursuing them. And we're very disciplined. Lots of us are highly self-motivated. We don't need lots of encouragement. And we do get on with, with, with things without being asked. Here are the places where we're a bit more ambivalent. We're more ambivalent around seeking out responsibility being the first person to speak up. And interestingly, we're more ambivalent about being able to see opportunities rather than challenges. And here are the things that may well trip us up. We tend to be really perfectionist. That's actually not great for entrepreneurship because in <coughs> entrepreneurship, you've just got to get out there and try and be willing to give it a go and see what happens. If you wait till it's perfect before you take it on the stage, it's not going to work for sure. We tend to get caught up in the detail a bit too much. Uh, and we want to have full information before we'll make a decision. Well, again, in an entrepreneur's world, you often are having to take decisions without that full information. So in relation to our own uh, Guildhall entrepreneurs, I then want to kind of point to five things coming out of this research that we are seeing as things that I think really make the difference between 
those who start to succeed and those who don't quite. And I hope that some of this may resonate with things that have been said earlier today. So here they are. The first is that it seems to be really important that people find ways to enable an idea, an artistic idea, and a business outlook actually to support each other, to feed each other, to enhance each other, rather than be mutually exclusive. You have to believe that your artistic interests and something around sustainable business actually can go together. It's no good thinking that the idea of business is a completely dirty thing and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the arts. It just doesn't work. So that's the first thing. The second is that you really need to identify a need, a gap that you're going to fill, something that's really going to benefit or appeal to an audience, as well as working very closely from what you want to do artistically. Again, it's not about these being mutually exclusive. It's about finding the places where they really connect. Third point is just about building confidence in your business potential. What we've noticed with our entrepreneurs is that there's quite a journey to find the courage to make something really work beyond it being a hobby. <coughs> It's very easy to have a great idea and think that it's a pet project that you'll do on the side as a little hobby and you'll never get properly paid for it. So you do have to be able to go out of your comfort zone and really start to build the courage to do these things, to learn from the experience and believe that they will be sustainable. Fourth thing is about being able to pitch about being able to boil things down to their essence and really communicate, express those in words and through your artistry. And lastly, and this has been quite surprising, certainly to me, is the importance of actually being able to network, go out there and build partnerships to help get what you want to do off the ground. And we found that actually quite a lot of our entrepreneurs have find this really, really difficult. They've got fantastic ensemble skills as artists, but in that world of getting out and networking, it's much more difficult. But it's undoubtedly one of the things that really helps to make it successful. Helena, thank you. That's, that's <coughs> incredibly helpful, um, partly because it's fascinating and also because it very easily structures what, what we can talk about. Because I actually think it's worth us taking each of those five things and just having a bit of a discussion about, from all of your own experiences, what, you know, how you've grappled with those issues. Um, so the first of them is, is about that really difficult thing of marrying the creative and the artistic with the business. And I suppose the first question is, it might be a very obvious one, why do we or you as creatives and artistic people find the idea of business and money so difficult? What's, what is it that's the sort of psychological block for someone who comes through music college and doesn't want to have to think about how much they're getting paid or whether a particular idea that they have makes business sense? Um. Uh, yeah, I think it might just um, be quite a simple point that we haven't been trained in business. I mean, that's, that's what I've felt. You know, I've been trained as a pianist for 20 years, um, but no one's ever actually told me how to go out there and sell what I'm doing. You know, I've been sitting in the practice room, basically. So I think that, for me, is, is quite difficult. And, and again, what Helen was saying, I actually got to about 30, the age of 30, where I thought, time to start being an entrepreneur, and I'm very much learning on the job. Um, which is great, and it's a really good way to learn by, doing my, by having my own experiences, but it's, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much new to everything still in, in year three of the festival. Well, can I just say that I've been involved with quite a few courses trying to teach business to, to musicians, and actually, when you get taught business, you don't learn that much about the day-to-day -day running of something, and I think that we'd all probably agree with our own careers that the best thing we've got out of it is just diving in and doing yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. And this idea of kind of being taught a business role, I mean, I think... Being creative is actually one of the best business skills. So if you're sitting there thinking, you know, why is there a market? I think we're going to come to this in a second. Why is there a market for this product? Actually thinking, you know, who likes this? Why is it interesting? 
and then thinking about, you know, I can do this in a really creative and interesting way, and that's actually half the battle of a business anyway, but we do it instinctively because it's what we, what we love doing. I'd say the music school, because I, I was slightly different. I was so institutionalised from the age of nine. I was at Cheatham's Royal College of Music eight years and simply barely knew how to turn on a computer when I graduated because I was slightly pre-internet as well, which is another interesting <coughs> point. So all this sort of thing happened and then suddenly um, you, you're meant to sort of know how to do everything. And actually, I, I would say even if it's just the basic, basic skills. And I think this is happening more now. I mean, at the Royal College of Music, for example, the Woodhouse Centre opened just as I um, sort of was about middle, middle way through my course. And I think the, the colleges are definitely catching on. Um, but it moves so quickly, technology, as well, I think. John, mm. I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I think, really, that just by doing it is the only way that you're really going to learn. But I think the earlier you start doing it, the better as well. I remember it was kind of first or second year at, at Guildhall here where we had a wing quintet and I was just using the contacts that I knew or contacts that other people knew to just phone someone up and say, you know, can we put an event on just to really go out and do it. And the earlier you start, the more, more mistakes you can make um, and you can learn from those and, and go forward, I think. Mm. Ruby, how do you feel about the word entrepreneur or the word business? I mean, do they... It's really... I was just thinking about those words and for me, it's... I've always been fascinated by human beings and meeting other human beings and communicating, be it by in a conversation or on the stage. And um, I do, I definitely grapple and fight with the word business and I'm sure because I see the music as much, much more important than I am. I, I feel like I am um, a vessel for the music and um, I try to keep myself and my hair and my makeup and my dress um, to it's not that you know I'm put, it just for me the music comes first and um, more than my image and this kind of thing and that's much deeper for me it goes it's more profound and it brings people together on a much deeper level so that's just my penny's worth on that but and uh, yeah no no go no go what we i was going to say is it is it does everyone feel that it's possible to have a successful career as a musician where the music comes first without paying that sort of attention almost first and foremost <coughs> to image packaging business I was, I was going to say that actually i think i mean for example you mentioned the word networking i think musicians find the word networking a really dirty word it implies a sort of <laughs> you know, brown nosing something. It's, something, it's something quite kind of derogatory about it. And actually, I think the point of everything you do is in service of the music, I think that can still stand. Yeah, totally. And the mm. point of it is yeah. that you're trying to bring the, what you do to a broader audience. I mean, so I, yeah. I work half in, in classical, and half in pop music. And I think the pop world have got a really good, I mean, whatever cynical ideas you might have about them, they have a really good idea of how the music becomes marketed. And, and so it's not so much you're trying to kind of push it down that avenue because you have to. It's more like thinking, you know, is that cover image, is, is that kind of profile picture of me, does it sum up the sort of music I'm doing, is the kind of creative aspect of my life? And it's just about kind of making a package that, that really helps the music. And I think yeah. that's the thing. It's, it's all about kind of helping. It's whether you're networking, whether you're meeting people who can help you in the journey, or whether you're doing kind of, a, you know, something kind of entrepreneurial, inverted commas. It's all about this idea of helping what you're kind of fundamentally doing, which is the creativity, mm. which is for me anyway. Well, there's, a, there's a big narrative now around leadership, which is all about leadership as service um, rather than leadership as just creating um, commercial value. It's all about something much more around stewardship and being in service of a wider picture, a greater good, um, recognising that actually in order to do that, you have to be able to make money because without that, the money, you're not going to be able to serve. Absolutely. And so, uh, it, I don't know about um, everyone else on this panel, but for me, it was um, the reality of earning a living and paying my bills was a hugely, it was, I had to um, put dinner on the table and had to survive and pay my rent. So it was really important for me to do my very best um, and, and to discover the music that resonated w with me. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So can I ask each of you then, just in, if we're talking quite <coughs> sort of basically about the, 
creativity versus finance, let's say. Um, for each of you, where's, where's it come from? Have you developed where you are because you've <coughs> needed to put food on the table and pay the bills, and you've shaped your career in such a way that can make that happen? Or have you gone, this is the thing that I want to do, this is the project I want to do, now I need to think <coughs> around how I can make it make financial sense? What's been the biggest driver for you? For me and, and, and the group which we formed seven years ago, it was definitely the creative idea that really we just got together as a group of friends in South Monks and and wanted to play particular pieces of chamber music which we hadn't had the chance to play and that's, what it, that's how it came about. And it was kind of a couple of years went by before we thought actually this is becoming a thing and if we now put time and effort into it, um, it can become a bigger part of our professional lives and everyone was doing their own different things. So the creative, creativity was definitely the starting point but then it was almost... Right, so now how do we bring the, how do we make this financially viable, where do we go? Uh, and what was important for us actually was just to look around and see the people around us who we'd come into contact, who could help us. And we, when, when we formed as a charity in 2011, that was a really key role, because you, you assemble a board of trustees, essentially, who each of them brings a different skill. And from there, it's already like you're, I mean, it's different, again, if, you're just, if it's just you, but I was lucky and we were lucky to have a whole kind of family network beneath us and that gives you they believe in your in your product essentially and it makes you believe in your product more and very briefly how did you make it financially viable um by not always doing to begin with not always doing the things that we wanted to do i think we often found that um going to do a concert doesn't always pay very well um but what we also love doing and as a kind of side set was to do lots of education work so we found that actually going into schools and we go in and we do workshops, we play student compositions with them, we do lots of different things, which that seems to, that, that kind of off is a large proportion of what we do, and that helps almost fund some of the other more creative projects, which are harder to fund, I think. Sam, how about you, Piano Week? <coughs> Sorry, yes, um, the same as John, I mean, it was definitely the creative, I want to create this, and the money's going to have to come from somewhere, so it was an idea which just had to run, because <laughs> I was uh, sort of too far down the line before it... I, I was too far down the line to possibly back out of it, put it that way, so it had to work. Um, and I, I just basically targeted everybody possible to get the funding together. And, and by that, I don't actually just mean musicians. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I actually went very much outside the music circle as well. Um, just because I think for businesses and corporations, we're actually quite exotic, and it's very interesting you know, to, to turn up and have a new piano festival in Wales that hasn't happened before. Um, and I think it does catch the eye of, of business people, actually, in corporations with, not, with nothing to do with music. Um, so, yes, I definitely wanted to do this, this project and then just sort of worked non-stop <laughs> to get the money together and um, got some wonderful support, actually, from, from musicians as well. And actually, we have Gillian Humphreys, who's here today. Sorry, Gillian, to mention you, but she, the Concordia Foundation helped Piano Week start. Um, yeah, so it was, it was just a very, quite a tough beginning, but it was definitely worth it. Yeah. Um, Gabby and, and Toby, because I know that you both, as Toby, you mentioned that you do work in both the classical world effect, contemporary classical, and also the pop world. And Gabby, you're, you do session work as well as your um, mm. family work. So can I just ask you both for some thoughts on that and actually in order to, in effect, in order to financially support one thing, you do another thing as well. Downton Abbey certainly helps, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> but um, it's, I mean, for me, it was very, very personal circumstances, which is what made me really push my career over the last three years. I um, suddenly became a single mother um, with two very, very young children. So it went from thinking about um, self-financing, looking after myself, looking after my children, and also actually becoming the sort of role model for my children of a woman going out to work. And music is a very, very hard thing to do. There's a lot of women in our profession um, simply have to have babies incredibly late. Um, because of lack of um, support within organisations, maternity care, th cover, things like that. And um, so for me, it was a very personal reason. And the sessions and learning to say yes to everyone has really, really helped. And I've learned a lot from the mistakes I made when in my early 20s, when I left the college, thinking, well, I'm just going to make a career playing Zanarkis and Lackerman. 
you know, this is, this is all I care about is interpreting, you know, very, very tricky pieces of music which no one else wants to touch. And I just thought that that was me set. And when the London Symphony Theatre didn't call every week or BCMG, and it got a bit quiet, and then I obviously I went on to have my children, um, I first started working in Abbey Road in 2007, and it was a total fluke, because the session world is an enigma, and everyone always asks, how do, you, how do you get in? And for me, I was actually broadcasting on the proms, and um, a violinist who was working also on the proms said, I've just left the LSO, and I'm becoming a fixer for cool music. And I was like, oh, Nicole, that's fantastic. Just in the pub afterwards. And then she said, really? Because everyone else is saying, why on earth are you leaving the London Symphony Orchestra and working with all that film stuff? And I said, oh, I think it's just great. Why not? And six months later, I got the call. And that's the truth. You know, that's how it happened. It was total fluke. So now I find that, yes, the sessions, uh, yes, financially do help this, you know, to become possible. But you have to still enjoy doing what you're doing. And you have to do everything you do with integrity. Yeah, I completely agree. So, I mean, it, it keeps, we keep coming back to this idea of you leave college and you go, shit, there's a big wide world in front of me, what do I do? I mean, thinking of, <clears throat> so as a composer, if we think of every year, there are probably about 30 composers that leave just the five conservatoires in London, and think of how many composers are needed in the world and how many that adds up to be over the course of, let's say, 10, 10 years. So I sort of try to almost make a kind of have, have enough fingers, enough pies, have enough things in place that I thought one of them's got to work, right? <coughs> so I carried on wanting to be a composer of concert music. That seemed to be the, the grown-up thing to do. That seems to be the thing with integrity. So I kept that on, but then I thought, like, okay, well, I'll do a master's and then maybe a PhD. That can get me kind of academic life. And then I thought, well, I'll... Because I've always loved pop music, I'll kind of see if I can find anything in that world. And actually, again, fluke. It keeps, keeps going back to this kind of fluke thing. I had a friend who had a friend who happened to be quite a, an important... Um, uh, DJ and producer and said, would you come and help me with something? I said, okay, you know, why not? I think it would be kind of one-off thing that actually that's sort of lowbrow compared to being a real composer, which is very different. And actually it goes back to the thing of integrity. I mean, the thing that s surprised me the most is that it, in fact, um, so as a, as a composer of, should we say, concert music, you're very, very lucky if you get a, you know, 300 quid commission for a premiere and then maybe even a second performance. How exciting. And after that sort of, the, that piece is, you know, gone to the annals of your CV. And actually, seeing the pop world really has inspired me much more because they've got a very different attitude. They want to create new things. They want to create new sounds. It's <coughs> interesting. There's much more sort of, well, fu funding fundamentally for um, development and that kind of thing. And actually, it, it's really, um, rather than sort of being the thing on the side that keeps my classical career um, afloat and enables me to pay rent and eat, actually, it's turned out that pop music stuff is the stuff that I have found is much more creatively open for me, and I've enjoyed just as much, if not more, than the classical world. Mm -hmm. So I'm in an interesting position where they're kind of comparing the two and finding actually the, the pop world is allowing me to do more creatively, which mm -hmm. is brilliant for me. Just add, like, um, to any aspiring young musicians here that there is room for everyone. I'm a great believer that mm. there is room for every single human being to make music if they want to. And you just have to keep the faith and the love for what you do, primarily. And if there's enough passion there, and you know, it's very interesting what you were saying about earning a living versus um, the inspiration behind why we perform and why we create wonderful projects and um, do these things. It's a combination of the two. And we just have to keep, um, keep our friendships and uh, um, inspiration um, there and that people we encourage each other um, to do what we love doing and because it's a really profoundly wonderful thing music and it spans the ages we've you know they've been doing it since we began and it's so important for us and I do hope that one day our government will realize mm -hmm. that <laughs> <laughs> But do you how, know what? Just how important it, it is. Mm. Mm. But until they have realised, we haven't got much money to do this wonderful thing. No. And I think it's very, very nice to be able to say this is what we should all do passionately. We should do it with integrity and joy. Yeah. But the things about friendships, I think the point is that we need to build communities that we can help each other. And that Absolutely. is probably fun. That's probably financial as well. It's probably to do with, we get back to this idea of business as a dirty word. It's all about creating 
you know, groups, people who can help each other, and that is as yeah. much networking and business as it is about mm. sort of joy. Uh, totally. And in a sense, it sounds like there's a tension between this idea of business as being something that's ultimately competitive and what you're describing, which could potentially sound, you know, pie in the sky, rosy, ludicrous to someone with a real business head on about a much more supportive, co-creative kind of environment. But actually, that's the way that a lot it's of business people are talking yeah. as well. You know, business is moving away from <coughs> this much more competitive, there is only space for one person at the top of an organisation, there is only space for one person to make a profit, that actually we're starting to work in a more community way yes. and supportive way but I mean where do you find because I imagine for someone who comes out of music college with their heart wide open saying I want to make great music and then they get the knocks that anyone inevitably gets you don't get paid enough you don't get the opportunities what have you all found is useful as a kind of a tool to get yourself past that psychological pain in a way and get to a point where you say I fully believe that there is space for everyone to make music and I want to be part of an urban family. Like, mm. what have you had to go through to develop that sort of confidence and the confidence to be able to stand up and say, this is my project, this is my pitch, it's fantastic. <coughs> yeah. For me, it's having compassion, basically having people that are on your side and that want you to do well. It's, um, and feeling the support from your mates and from your family. Um, it's been fundamental. For me and to also be a shoulder to cry on for my friends who are as well who just to keep each other going and keep believing because it is tough but there is space for everyone i think also acknowledging because i'm really bad at this acknowledging that you have done a lot and that you have achieved a lot um because i get to the end of my piano festival and actually my friends and my partner point it out the, the last day or the morning after the last day i say OK, what didn't go well, now we've got to move on to next year. Now we've got... And, you know, there isn't any space where I've actually just said, you've just, you've just run a piano festival, so, you know, just have a cup of tea first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, I think we can be... T t it's true, there isn't a glass of wine. Um, I think we can be incredibly hard on ourselves. Like, you know, you're not doing enough, you've got to, you know, you're getting older. It's not, I think, you know, to be honest, is what I think about. And you've got to get on with things and now you've had another failure and just acknowledging that actually you've had a lot of success that are, you know, as, as Ruby said, people behind you, um, your friends and, and also in business all the time, no matter what's gone wrong. So I think that's quite important to remember. And we um, were talking just, oh, sorry, sorry, to... just very quickly before that you should also let yourself have a day off as well or half a day off or an evening off or an hour <laughs> off or something and not feel bad about it. Yeah, and that takes some learning actually, I think, doesn't it? I think I've only just learned that recently actually too be able to stop and have an evening off and... Teach me how. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very Perhaps, perhaps yeah. there's space for a workshop on the concept of the weekend. I mean, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a musician, but I am a freelancer and I also have had to work very, very hard at that. I mean, it takes an enormous amount of discipline to push yourself to go to work, but it also takes an enormous amount of discipline to pull yourself back from, from work. Um, Gabby, Toby, do you have anything else to Yeah, add? Just to, I mean, the whole concept of my urban family idea is about family um, who you're not born, born with, born into, but the family that you make. And we're very, very, very lucky, as I keep saying, actually, just in the dressing room before I came out on stage to Dave, I said, gosh, we're so lucky that we're friends. And we actually go to work with our friends. And, you know, in, in my little niche um, music school thing, where I'm sure there's a lot of us from music school, these are friends I've known since nine years old who have been through every life experience with me as well. And as Ruby said, you know, and Ruby and I are very close friends, also went to Chet's. Rubes and I FaceTime each other from various hotels all around the world <laughs> because that connection of checking in with your friend when you're in a strange city, working with an orchestra you've never worked with before, you know, it, it's so important to, to say, you know, I'm a bit, you know, feeling a bit iffy about this and speak to someone that absolutely knows you. Um, so I, I would say that, and also the, the big tip I tend to give people when they're coming up with these ideas is to work with people who um, have the same ideas as you, who believe in the same things. And with classical music, it's still very fragmented that you'll have someone that maybe, you know, wants to do an audition and be in an orchestra, and that's absolutely great. 
I never had that inclination. So if I called up my friend who has only ever played in an orchestra and doesn't quite get, or maybe just has a totally different mindset, um, I'm making it very, very uh, sort of general. And I sort of say, oh, well, I've got this gig at Ronnie's at two o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm so excited about it, it's great. And they're like, what, you actually want to improvise? You actually want to play without music? <laughs> and they look at me like I'm an absolute, you know, idiot, like we're doing a totally different job. I'm talking very specifically now. But, you know, so working, creating projects, working with fellow musicians, like today with Lizzie Ball, who cre who's created this incredible club night, Classical Kicks at Ronnie Scott's and at St. James Theatre. We, we, you know, this group has is, is had so many different names. And it's about playing with people you really love being with and who are totally on the same wavelength. I haven't got much more to add. I mean, I completely agree with that. And actually, everything I've done, I've tried to work with people that I like. So, you know, I, I tried to have a, um, a co-founded a, a, an opera company and I did it with someone I wanted to work with. It's really important to, to engage with your colleagues. And also, likewise, if you're in a position where you have some sort of either power or control, I mean, in my position, I end up uh, be able to curate and commission a couple of things. And it's, you know, it's a natural thing to go to your friends and create the community that, that you're in. So I guess, yeah, supporting friends is very important for all of us. Um, we've got about um, 15, 20 minutes, and I'd love to throw it open now. I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions that you have. Maybe it'd be useful just for me to recap on the five things that Helena um, <laughs> gave us, is that just, just to kind of have in your mind that the first one was about marrying up your artistic and your business goals. The second one was about identifying a need and a gap. Um, building confidence, pitching, and networking. Um, and we've pretty much touched on... We didn't talk specifically about pitching and networking, but really everyone, I think, spoke to how important it is to talk to people, not just people you want to get money out of, but also people who can support you. Um, so let's have just raise your hand and we'll try and get... OK, so there's one, two, three and four and five. Let's start with those five. So do you want to come down the front, those three first, and then... Hi. Um, I... I don't know if this is a rude question, so, you know, tell me if it is, right? <laughs> but um, here's an opportunity to actually share how you do actually make your money. I don't need to know how much you make. I'm not, I don't want to be that rude. But we always talk about generating income streams and, you know, direct fan marketing. How can you generate streams of income for yourself? And it all sounds a bit like the River Jordan. I want to know, how do you get paid for what you do? Um, because actually I think people get paid in lots of different ways, some for their time, some for their writing expertise, some for their consultancy, some for their performance, some for their composition. It's like, what do you actually get paid for? All right, anyone who feels comfortable answering that question, <laughs> maybe just, just pitch in, zoom round, a rough balance of 50% is this and, you know, 20% is this. Yeah, how do you pay your bills? Uh, so I'll, I'll take the plunge. So I have... Um, through the pop world, most of my money comes from my royalties. So I said it's about maybe 75% of my money is through that. And then I have an academic job as a lecturer, so that's about another 10%. And then the tiny bit in between is my commission fee for classical commissions and any other miscellaneous bits and pieces. Great, thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> it is quite a rude question. <laughs> But, it, I, yeah. it's, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I earn my money from performing, and I'd really like to do a bit more teaching as well. But basically, yeah, that's how. I, I probably earn quite a lot of my money from administrating, which is something that I've not trained in. You know, I've got no degree. Um, but I probably earn 50% of that from my kind of managing my own ensemble, but then also the experience I learned from that, then to go and work for an arts organisation. Um, um, I managed the Hebrides Ensemble in Scotland as well, and that's very similar to what I do for my own ensemble, but then it's it just, that's the regular kind of money that pays the rent, and then the perform performing is another 30% of that maybe, but not the main, not the main part at all. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when it kind of switches the other way from, from that. And unless Gabby and Sam want to pitch in at all... We can... Well, just 50% yeah. sort of session work, working with people I'll never see again, and the other 50%, I'd say, um, long-term collaborations and groups and, and solos and masterclasses, and I've got two students. 
<laughs> it's, it's the same for me, really. Plus, I do um, a little bit of recording. I record for sharp music, which is a nice little bit of extra income on the side. Um, plus a bit of teaching, and the rest is performing and um, trying to raise funds for Piano Week, which is also kind of... <laughs> <laughs> but but I, that is, the, the festival itself is earning a little bit. It's, it's breaking even, at least, which is great. And that's through also the fact that it's... Uh, a summer school as well as a festival, so I'm getting some participant fees. So it's all just it's a mix again. It's always yeah. Okay, next question, which is on around there in the red. Hi. Um. So I, you guys have talked a little bit about how networking is a dirty word. Um. I have. Uh, I have no issue. You know, I quite quite enjoy meeting new other musicians and having a good chat. And I have lots of experiences like Gabby and Toby described where uh, just because I've been excited and open-minded, something's come out of nothing just because I was having a, a sort of friendly chat with another musician about something. What I find really difficult is going into a conversation where I know I'm coming at it with a pitch and I, f I feel quite, yeah, sort of dirty <laughs> and sort of going in and thinking, I want something out of this specifically. Um, does any, do any of you have any advice on how to approach that without sort of you know, clamming up, essentially, um, or feeling bad about it? My advice is don't have that mentality. And actually, I try and... If, if I meet someone in a, in a party or a kind of, you know, a bar or something, I know they're important. Because it's very easy to sort of think, oh, shit, I should make that person, I should pitch them, I should make them know what I'm doing. I'd much rather try and see if I engage them on a creative level. And if I do, then say, can I take your email? Can I talk to you? Can I go for coffee with you? And then think that's the pitch time. And I'll say, you know, it, you know, actually, this is what I want to get out of that. So instead of sort of trying to make a friendship in something that's business, trying to see if the friendship is there first. Mm. It's much, much easier, I found as well, to pitch in a very personal way rather than set up a formal business meeting take someone out for a glass of wine or something. That, I mean, for me, that, that is much less terrifying. It's, Find it's, a poison of choice. It's what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's much less intimidating you know, to make it immediately personal. And, and ask them personal questions, not just make it immediately about what you basically want from them. It's just the same, yeah, same as what Toby's saying. Yeah. And sort of talk about it from the other side a bit, because I get a lot of composers wanting to, for me or my groups to play their music. And I would definitely say less is more. Um, there's nothing worse than your inbox being clogged with emails. You know, I recently, you know, someone sent me after a concert and, and then checked in four days later to make sure I got that email. And, you know, I'm, I've, as you know now, a mother of two, I'm just not going to respond straight away. And it's, it's really, it's a bit like, you know, the advice you get for dating, you know, he's just not that into you. Just, just, just <laughs> chill out. <laughs> <laughs> And if people really want to make something happen, they will. Swipe um, left. Yeah, swipe left. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I can see some horror of muso funding Tinder app. <laughs> 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 All right. Business market for someone in the room. Let's move on to another question down the front. Um, hi. Uh, as someone who hasn't gone through conservatoire training but does consider myself to be a musician, I found that um, studying in a university, uh, talking about cross arts, which we were talking about earlier, um, I do find that sort of thinking about ways, finding a niche is really easy for me. Mm. Uh, but I do find in terms of general performance opportunities, perhaps that is a hindrance for me. And I was wondering in terms of new platforms for doing things, such as your urban family doing pop music, different things, do you find that a very prescribed or rigorous conservatory, I know you said earlier, Gabriella, that you know, literally from the age of nine you're at Cheatham's, did you find such a prescribed form of education a help or a hindrance with new endeavours? It's absolutely 50-50 for me. Yeah. Um, it helped a lot because I'm sharing the stage with people I've known obviously from a very young age so contact wise it was fantastic um the other side which I think actually is probably a bit more important and I say this to people it made me a, maybe a good cellist but um an incredibly dysfunctional adult um because of the things discussed not knowing even how to write a check. I mean, basic things, cooking, cleaning, the stuff that you may take for granted because you did it. And actually, university, um, you don't want to change what's happened, of course, but I always admire the people I work with who had the training at 
at any university that they made them more entrepreneurial because they had to make the opportunities happen. And actually, that's much more realistic. And I never feel that you're behind or anything because there's a, there is a place for everyone. And in, in all my groups, there's a big mixture. Eleanor, um, that made you squirm. <laughs> mm. Well, just the idea that conservators are making thoroughly dysfunctional adults. Well, no, I, <laughs> I'll be I'm, curious, that. I'm curious to know, not, not, to, not to say you're old at all, but I'm curious to know whether things have changed more they recently. Have. The thing of oh, yeah. learning to write a cheque. Or I believe I believe they don't make checks anymore. But <laughs> I've made a note. We must have a class in writing checks. Um, no, I mean I think absolutely things have changed. But I think it you know it is a, it is an ongoing challenge when you are going deep, deep, deep into an artistic craft. Um, that requires a very special place of being in oneself, and and it does provide some challenges in other parts of our lives. I mean, I, I don't think I want to belittle the reality of what that challenge is. Um, every single one of us is individual and has mm. to find the way we've done it. I mean, clearly you've, you've found your way to be highly functional now. So that's, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess what we're all grappling with is how, how, can we, how can we enable, support the creative voices of emerging musicians to be themselves and also to be highly functional in the world. And, and we're all grappling with that really seriously, without doubt. Mm. It's good to hear. <laughs> um, there was one, Lizzie over here. Hi, um, I just, uh, I actually was gonna say something else, but I'm gonna pick up on something Helena said. Um, I don't know if this already happens, but a lot of you were quite, um, rightly talking about the importance of support of friends. I think from my point of view, when I set up Classical Kicks, that's absolutely true. I think also what is also vital is, I think as musicians, we're sometimes um, in danger and it's not a negative thing, but because we have to focus so closely on a particular discipline, I think we can cut ourselves off from other worlds that actually can be extremely beneficial, particularly when you're trying to set up an entrepreneurial venture. And a lot of the, um, advice of, that I've got from you know contacts and actually just friends that I know who have set up businesses in completely different ventures has been invaluable and I, I think we forget like we all know a lot of people actually we have friends we have you know colleagues we have parents friends who may run businesses and and these people are invaluable because they have the, the experience and actually if you have a project and you're not sure how to structure it or how to to make it work financially as well as creatively, it can literally be as simple as picking up the phone and going, actually, this guy would know because he's done it for 40 years. And so then my question was, is, is that something that, I mean, you're at the Guildhall, Helena, is that right? So is that something that the Guildhall is implementing? Is there a, a call, do you think, for you know, more cross collaborations with other disciplines? Because I do think that's perhaps where you know, we can be helped as artists to just see outside our yeah. box sometimes, yeah. you know? So. We, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've been working on here a lot in, in recent years is the collaboration within the institution across our discipline, so between drama and music, because we are a conservator of both, and um, we've certainly made a lot of progress with that. There's lots more to do, and we are finding that it is hugely productive. The students... Um, have their eyes open, they love working together, they, they start to feel what they can learn from one another, um, both in terms of how similar they are and how different they are in their approach to their, to their um, artistic work. And I think we're also, you know, we're, we're increasingly doing lots of project work with partners outside the institution and across further disciplines. And there's no question that that's the way the world is going. And some of the big questions in the world, you know, that we're facing now, for example, how do we, how do we, um, how do we work together on healthy ageing, for example? You know, it's a big, big issue, and the arts have got so much to contribute. So I think what we'll see is more and more collaboration across disciplines like that. And I do think that that's a hugely healthy thing for everyone to, to be exposed to in some mm. shape or form. What's healthy mm -hmm. ageing? Hmm? What's healthy ageing? Uh, so, so uh, <laughs> well, simply that we're all living longer. OK. <laughs> we're all living longer, and ultimately that costs okay. a great deal of money when we all start to get mm. sick. So, so there's a huge amount of work going mm. on. How do, we, how do we enable human beings to live well and to, to live productive, yeah. 
fulfilled lives mm. longer. And um, yes, because the other thing I've noticed um, is that the more I perform, the kind of the better I become as a because I've had more experience. And I just also hope that um, we don't become obsessed with young artists. And I think it's really important that young artists have have a have a say and they have their place in the world. Um, but I also think they have such a huge amount to learn from the older generation of people, and we have to be really careful that we that we we admire and that these people, these older generation people are around, like the Alice Coots and the Sarah Connollys, but also, you know, just that we really support everyone in music. Um, it's really important, I think. It's sort of become in the media so obsessed with youth and you see it in pop music. Everyone has to be 21. Everyone's mm. lying about their age. And it's really troubling, and I think it has a very deep psychological impact on how we view um, image, and um, it just worries me. And there was mention of that in the previous panel as well, I remember, at the beginning. Mm. Um, let's yeah. take one last question. There was one in the middle. Yes. Is it towards the back with the grey jacket on? Gillian Humphreys from the Concordia Foundation. Um, I'm really thrilled with today. I think it's been really very impressive um, that we have this chance to be able to link our side of it, you know, after having a career in the arts, but also with young people. I'm here with four people who have been working with the Concordia Foundation, and I thought it was lovely of Sam to give us a mention, because the most important thing for us is building a bridge. And what Ruby just said is about bringing generations together and we work with international artists. I've been also, um, Helena, I was very impressed with what you're saying. But what I would like to ask is, does that cover the board? And I heard how many students you have here and how many students there are in all the colleges. How many of the young people actually benefit from this? Because um, I've just been holding auditions in London and they even come, the other day an opera singer came from Bucharest who'd been, was so impressive, it was amazing. She'd been singing in Vienna, scholarship had finished, went back to Bucharest working on tables but came to audition for us which amazed me because I thought she'd be coming across the board but no she couldn't get any other auditions and she could have walked into Covent Garden she was so impressive but what amazed me was with with them when they come at the end of our auditions we always say pull up a chair and tell us what it is that you're looking for and I am so impressed by the people who are the young students who are from overseas that they come looking wonderful. They make a presentation that is quite incredible. That doesn't always happen, I'm afraid, from young musicians and artists in this country, which is what, and I've come through all that, so I'm always encouraging, and we have a complete floor of costumes and DJs and everything to support young musicians who find it very hard to actually find clothes but what I wanted to know was when they come to me and they ask at the end they give the most amazing deep thoughts of why they would come to Concordia because we cover schools orphanages we're not linked with any colleges we're totally free to be able to do it but um, I can't do what the colleges do which is what you're doing so magnificently giving them this opportunity but does that give the opportunity to everybody that comes into the Guildhall? Or is it just a certain, you know, you, you, you give them, a, you, you peer them off already? Do they all have a chance to have this finish and this knowledge? Because today, I, I thought this would be heaving here today, for absolutely every seat filled, because it is so amazing that we're able to come and, and learn yes. so much. All the young people here, it's so impressive. It's, pre yes. it's pretty cool. So the quest, I suppose the question is, do all of your students at Get the opportunity. learn how to pitch, really? <coughs> learn how to present themselves? I, I think they all have the opportunity to learn, whether they all take that opportunity and understand <coughs> why it's important at that point is, is, is more tricky. Um, I think we've got lots of work to do still to, to build some of the, the attributes, the soft skills, the hard skills, the mindset, that sense of, uh, uh, which I think is absolutely critical of not just a creativity, but the imagination to see opportunities as opportunities and to be able to take them up. That's one of the things I've really heard from everybody mm -hmm. here is it seems to me you're you've seen opportunities and taken them. And that's 
that's, that's an area that I think we still need to work on, is, is to be able to see that there might be lots of different opportunities, and they're all in equally valid. We don't have to live in a hierarchy where only one thing is the, the, the possible goal. There can be lots and lots of goals, and some of the most fulfilled careers come out of taking those opportunities. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I was feeling a little depressed earlier, and now I'm not. So um, I hope you similarly are feeling hopeful and excited and inspired, um, for which I just have to thank everyone here. It's John, Sam, Gabby, Toby, Helena, and Ruby. Thank you for coming.